All right, let's stand and pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, Lord everywhere and fills all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls a good life. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. So we're back downstairs because I have a PowerPoint and it's show and tell. I'm going to show you some stuff as well. And um, next week, obviously, we don't have class because it's Thanksgiving Day. But we do have church in the morning for the Acopis of Thanksgiving. Which you're going to learn what an Acopis is today. So today we're going to talk about the liturgical cycle. And about how all those services, what do they mean? Why we do services in a certain order? And... The best way to look at it is cycles within cycles within cycles. And thank God you had a bunch of monks who sat and figured this all out because I can't even figure it all out. But anyway, so we're going to talk about that and why we worship the way we do. So, everyone can see. Like I did the wedding last week in, in Virginia in this nice big Greek church. And everyone was sitting all the way in the back. Like, would you come forward so you can... <laughs> anyway, so, the life as an Orthodox Christian is built around a liturgical cycle. And what we mean is that we have what's called a liturgical year. And the liturgical year, what do you think the center of the liturgical year is? Pascha. In a certain sense, everything is built off of Pascha. And so um, that liturgical year, we go from Pascha to Pascha. One of my professors used to call it the, the liturgical horizon that we never get to. We always see it out in the distance, and it just keeps going for all eternity. Of course, being Orthodox, we can't make things simple. So not only do you have a liturgical cycle based around Pascha, but you also have a, a, a scriptural cycle, which is based around the church new year, which is based off the Byzantine new year, which is September 1st. So just go with it. All right. We just know that we have all these different things that go on. Um, and we also have cycles of feasts and fasts, right? Yesterday we entered one of those fast periods for the nativity. And so we have four major fasting periods in the church. We'll talk about them. And we have all the different feasts. So not only do you have this liturgical cycle of Pascha to Pascha and this scriptural cycle, but we also have these cycle of feast days, which also encapsulate the scriptural cycle. And then, yeah, September 1st, and then on top of all that, because again, we can't get things right, we have what's called the Typicon. What does Typicon remind you? What word? Typical, right? Typical. So that's exactly where it comes from. Jean-Luc, good to see you. So typical means just that. Um, what is done typically. So, of course, in the Orthodox world, you can't just have one. You've got to have two. You have the, the typicon called the Great Church Typicon and the typicon called the Marsaba. None of this is testable. Mar Saba, which means Saint Saba, which is from a, a, a monastery outside of Jerusalem. So the Greek world, the Byzantine churches, adopted the Great Church one, which is based off of the services at Hagia Sophia. And the Russian Slav world adopted the Mar Saba. How different are they? Very little. You only know it if you're a liturgical geek. <laughs> you can only be able to notice the little differences. And then we have what's called the rubrics. So the rubrics, which means red. So if I open up something like this book, you'll learn what this is. You'll see there's little things in red. Those are instructions. That's what rubric means? Yeah, red. The instructions were written in red. So, so we have those sort of things that helps us. And then we have what's called the liturgical calendar. I'm still waiting for next year's. They sh it should have been in the shipment. It was not. I'm complaining to them. That's the liturgical calendar. Every year, the OCA, through the, some monks at St. Ticon, 
take all these books and all these things and they put it together. And so if, how do I know what I'm doing on this Sunday, which is November 19th? I look it up here and if I get to the right page and it says oh, it's the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, night Sunday of Luke, tone seven, we're gonna learn about that. The prophet Obadiah has all the saints that are commemorated on that day. It has the readings, and then it has in code all the instructions on how the service should go. And so if you're a choir director or anything, you have to be able to read the code, which is not that hard, but you just have to know what the typica is. Yeah? So when do we primarily read like from the Old Testament? Is that... Feast days, Eva feast days, and um, well, actually every day, because we have psalms every day, and we right. have all that sort of thing. And uh, particularly during Lent, you'll, it's integrated into the service. I mean, a lot of our right, services yeah, yeah. come from that. But so, but we do, we read it liturgically, right. only on eve of feast days or under certain circumstances. And do we read, I, I've heard that we pretty much go through the entire Bible. The New Testament. The New Testament. Wow. Every year we go through the entire New Testament. That was last week's class. Okay. <laughs> Wish you weren't here. <laughs> so anyway, so all this stuff, all this stuff is there for us to figure out how to put the services together. So just know that. So <clears throat> a couple of things that we have. We talked about the wheels within wheels. I'll get you to understand that. But we have a yearly cycle, we just talked about that, Pascha, right? From Pascha to Pascha, it's a yearly cycle. We also have what's called a monthly cycle. That's called the Menaean. Menaean, which means month in Greek. And Menaean, how many volumes do you think there are of the Menaean? How many months in a year? Twelve. So how many volumes of the Menaean? Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> So we have 12 volumes, and each one is about that thick. And to have a full and complete copy of the Mena printed Menaean runs about $2,000 to $3,000. And only, so we don't, very rarely will you see them in a church, but they're all on the internet. So now we don't have to. But everything is pretty much now electronic. So we have a Menaean. So that, and if you open the Menaean, I don't have a copy to show you. Um, you'll open it up on December or November 19th. It'll tell you everything, you, all the services, all the hymns, everything, the saints, everything for that day is found there. And then you have to figure out how to integrate that. But just go with it. Then we have with a weekly cycle. All right? A weekly cycle is in a cycle of eight. Okay? And... When, when, the pre, when the deacon or the priest says the reading is in tone three, that's from the octoikos, it's called, which is the Greek word for eight. Right? So that rotates. It starts on Easter at tone one, and every week it changes to a different tune. And when it gets to eight, you go back to tone one. And you do that through the entire year. Okay, so if you look at it and, and like this Sunday, I said, what is this Sunday? It is seven. Tone Seven. Last Sunday was. There you go. Next Sunday will be eight. eight. And so, then it starts again. And it starts again. Now, what is in that? Well, there are particular uh, readings. All eight tones are reflections on the resurrection in a way, but they're also musical patterns. And uh, so there are different ways to sing things in eight different ways. It's kind of a standardized. We use in this church what's called Obikod, which is basically royal court chapel chant from Russia. It's made in four-part harmony. It's got musical patterns. You'll probably recognize them. If, like the, when everyone knows, um, when we sing on Pascha night, Thy resurrection, O Christ our Savior, the angels in heaven do sing. That's tone six. All right? Everyone knows that. Now, of course, we're Orthodox, right? <laughs> so you have a Byzantine eight style. You have a 
an Arabic style, you have Kievan style, you have, you have like all these different types of tones. They tried to do an American eight tones and it's been a, it was a dismal failure. <laughs> and they keep saying they're going to try doing it. But for the OCA, because of our background, that's what we use. And so, and I think it's easy to, to follow. Um, so that so it's not only musical patterns, but it's also uh, reflections, you know, uh, spiritual reflections on different topics. All right, you with me so far? And then we have the daily cycle, which we are going to talk about, which comes from the Tipicon, what services you serve. If you, if you were ideally in a monastery or some, you would. There's a series of services you would do every day. All right, now. There are a couple of other books that we have. So we have this book called The Festal Menaean. All right? Menaean being month, feast being the feast. So all the major feasts of the church are in here, including instruction. So if I open it up and say, what am I going to do for Christmas? All the services for Christmas are here, including the incredibly complicated instructions on what you do when because depending on what day of the week Christmas falls because there's a whole cycle you have to do. So that's called the Festal Menaean. It has all the services. I'll pass it around for all the feast days. Then we have this wonderful book which is actually signed by Callisto Swear. In case you remember. Um, Can I see the screen room? What? Can you pass it over? Yeah. So the Lenten Triodian. This is all the services of Great Lent from the pre-Lenten Sundays. We're going to learn about that. Until the moment, to the moment I start singing my resurrection. All right? Because then we switch to another book. And so this has all the Lenten services in it. Everything, all the, all the verses, everything. All in there. Okay? Then, from the moment I start singing that, so all the way to All Saints, which is after, after uh, Pascha, it's called the Pentecostarian, which Pentecost means 50, right? So it's the 50 days from Pascha onward. So this has all the Easter services and all that other stuff, right? Lots of books. Nice. Why do in one book what we can do in like 40 or 50, right? So people say, well, why can't we just get one book where everyone can follow? Because the book would be about that thick, right? Because every, you have a new, every Year, November 19th, for example, what tone are you in? What week are you in? Where, you know, there's all, so there's fixed parts and rotating parts. Here's the other book. So there you go. So how do we figure it out? Well, that's why we got the monks who sit there and take all these wheels within wheels and put it together. And when the priests get it, the first thing we do is we look through it and we try to find the mistakes that they made. And then we complain to them. <laughs> you missed such and such on this day. No, that's not right. You know. Anyway. So that's their job pretty much. Yeah. So every jurisdiction, like you have the Greeks, will have their book that will come out. The Romanians. Everyone has their own set. But all the dates are the same. Yes. But no. Yeah. <laughs> should be. Yes, but no. Because, Yes. What is small, little, it's daily Vespers, which we don't really do here. I do every Wednesday at St. Vladimir's when I serve there. If you were bigger here, you would do it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of priests who do daily Vespers. Yeah. What's the difference between oh, Vespers are at night, Matins are in the morning? We're going to get to this. Okay, okay. Yeah. So anyway, well, I so... To answer your other question, are they all the same? Yes, but no, because it all depends on the calendar. And the calendar is the issue that Pete will fight about as Orthodox more than <laughs> right. anything else. Christmas in January? Though. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and as long as we're fighting about the calendar, we're in great shape. Because we're not fighting about who Christ is or any of that other. We're fighting about a calendar. So you'll have two calendars, right? You'll have the Julian calendar. And the Julian calendar was based from Julius Caesar and was based on, I think, was that, that the lunar calendar? And that was in much in force 
in the world until Pope Gregory decided it was inaccurate, which it is. Every year it, comes, it goes farther and farther off, and he created the Gregorian calendar, which is based, I think, on the solar. There's about 13 days difference between the two. But every so many hundred of years, there'll be another day added on. And eventually, they're going farther and farther and farther apart. So the, even the United States in the American Revolution, we were still under the Julian calendar. So it was when the Gregorian calendar was adopted worldwide, the Orthodox Church had a big question. Which one do we use? And so most of the Orthodox churches remain on the Julian calendar or the old calendar. But some of the Orthodox churches adopted a revised calendar where we would use the Gregorian calendar for all the fixed days, but we'd all use the Julian calendar for anything related to Easter. So that's what we do. We're in a modified calendar. So that's why our Easter is different than the Roman Catholic Easter. Sometimes it could be the same day, or like this year, it's going to be... Yeah, and then now next year, they'll fall, they'll, they'll fall on the same day. It all has to do with the, the, the how you calculate Easter, which is the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox, but then it all comes down to when do you determine what the spring equinox is, according to the calendar. So it gets complicated. Makes your head hurt. There's nothing that bores me more than to get into calendar arguments. And it's always, I know, it's always falls after a Jewish holiday, Passover. Right. It can never it's fall before. Not the but it's, American Easter it's very specific that we're not to use the Jewish calculations in the Christian calculation of Easter. That's from the First Ecumenical Council in 325. And that's all I want to go talk about the calendar. So if there are people, some, some jurisdictions remain old calendar. The church, our diocese in Alaska is all old calendar. They remained on the old calendar. Um, when I was a kid, so when the OCA was formed, we decided to go to the new calendar. And I remember that very, you know, we, 1970, we moved to the other calendar. Parishes got into arguments over the calendar. Some parishes split away. It's ridiculous. There is only one Orthodox Church in the world that is totally on the Gregorian calendar. And that is the church in Finland. Because they are also a state-supported church. They support two churches, the Lutheran and the Orthodox. And so by law, they made them all go on the same calendar. So, um, anyway, calendar, cal if you really want to read about it, You'll get more polemics on the internet about which calendar is correct than you'll ever want to read, and it'll hurt your brain when and your soul. When did the old calendars emerge? Just when, when the new calendar was, so that was the late 19th century, when this was kind of first brought out, and then they started, and so you have whole jurisdictions, we're the old calendarists or whatever. Um, it's just... Hank's father always said uh, the January Christmas was the right... But it's not January. It's December 25th. According to the Julian calendar, it's December 25th. According to the Gregorian calendar, it's January 7th. Right. So you're, you're using the January 7th, which is a Gregorian date, to talk about a feast day that is actually December 25th on the, on the, on the Julian calendar. You see what I'm saying? Christmas is still December 25th. Right. Whether either calendar, but if you use the Julian, then it would it would show up as January seventh because it's thirteen days apart. All right, just go with it. All I knew is as a kid, I got to celebrate two Christmases. <laughs> so there it is. In in Las Vegas, I did. I'd have a I'd have a January seventh. I bring a Russian priest in. Oh, would you? And I'd have, <coughs> people didn't know. Um, now, because I told you that we go from the date of Easter and every feast day associated with Easter is dated because of that first Sunday after the first full moon, that can change each year. So you can have one year, like this year, it's going to be very late, which means when you have to get the rest of the cycle in, you're going to have to add stuff in because it's a long year till the next Pascha. 
Sometimes it's very early and we gotta cut things to make sure everything aligns perfectly. It'll make more sense in a later slide. So you have what's called a long year versus a short year. So this year is a long year. Next year is gonna be a short year. So you'll see certain readings on a, the 29th Sunday after Pentecost will disappear or something like that. And then we use the, the Jewish way of dating the day. In other words, in the Jewish tradition, Think about Genesis, there was evening, there was morning, one day. So for the Orthodox, when evening happens, you're in the next day. So when the sun sets, you're in the next day. So that's why Vespers, which is the service of the setting of the sun, is the service for Sunday. It's the first service that we're celebrating for Sunday. So that's why it's important to come to the evening service because you're already starting to celebrate. Where can you see this much more aligned? Easter night. Right? We're all there. We're waiting to start the service. I cannot start the liturgy until it's midnight. So we have it timed pretty well, but sometimes you have to wait. You're like looking at the clock. Like, is it midnight yet? Is it midnight? Okay, now I can start celebrating the resurrection. So... We're going to go through the daily cycle, but just understand that, that evening is the next day, which of course the immediate one I get is, the, so that means that I don't have to fast. <laughs> like, so if, say, you know, post and I eat on, on Friday. So if I get rid of the, if I, if I don't have to fast Friday evening, right? Because we're in the next day. I said, yeah, but only if you started on Thursday evening, the fast. <laughs> There's always someone trying to figure it out. Yeah. But if the day starts in the evening, so when we're at Pascha night service, aren't we already in? Yes, we are. Today. Yes. And I'll explain why later. <laughs> there's, a, there's a reason for how it's all cycled. All right? And the other thing to remember... And the last point I want to make on this, every Sunday is called the Day of Resurrection. So if you listen very carefully to the Sunday hymns, they all, except for the ones about the saints and all that, they're all resurrectional. The, the, the tropars, which we'll learn what those are, Sunday is a small day of resurrection. Found in it, it's, it's just a lesser version of what we do on Pascha. So it's very interesting because, again, listen carefully and you will hear the resurrection come up over and over and over again during the divine liturgy because that's, in fact, what we're celebrating. And if I really want to confuse you, it's also the eighth day. <laughs> we, there's only seven days in a week. <laughs> but there's an eighth day, which is the day outside the day, outside the week, which is the resurrection. But it's the first day? It's the first day of the week. It's the last day of the week. It's the day outside of the week because of the resurrection. Yes, we love to think about these things. So just go with it. All right. So the, let's talk about the daily cycle first. I understand if I don't think about it. What? I understand if I don't think about it. That's exactly the way you should be. In most things in the church, you understand it if you don't think about it. Just do it. So, the daily cycle has its, has its rotation from the monasteries, right? So, if you ever go to stay in a monastery, somewhat in a seminary, but not quite like a monastery, this is where the roots of all our services come from and how they developed. Um, so, when we have all these different services that are prescribed, you, think, you have to always think in terms like, this is what they're doing in the monastery. Basically, if you're in a monastery, you don't sleep. Every time you get to sleep, they wake you up and come, go pray more, but, which is why I'm not a monk, by the way. So the Vespers is the evening service, right? It's the first service of the day. It's the service of the setting of the sun. So why do we sing, if you remember, in O Gladsome Light, which is one of the oldest hymns in the church. O Gladsome Light, we sing right after, right? 
That's the lighting of the evening lamp. And in some monasteries, they actually do that. Everything's dark until that hymn, and then they start lighting the evening, all the, all the lampadas. Well, I don't have minions to do that, so at least not a lot of minions. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's the glad to light, and then we say vouchsafe. Remember we sing, or they, they do hear what? Enable us, O Lord. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this evening without sin. Then that's the closing down of the prayer. And Lord, let us now, thy servant, depart in peace. St. Simeon's prayer. These are all the ones now that we're saying the evening. We have lit, lit the evening lamp. We've done our prayers for the setting of the sun. And we're getting ready for the new day. With me? Okay, you're looking confused there. I'm sorry. Okay. That's better tired than confused. So, God forbid you let the monks go to bed, right? You can't do that. So you have a next service, which is called Compline. Compline is the service before they go to bed. So you finish, if you're in a monastery, you finish Vespers, you go and you eat. And you do whatever tasks you have. And then you bring them back together to do Compline. And Compline is the, servi the, the service of blessing everyone, and they literally do bless everyone to go back to their, their cells, they call it their rooms, to go to bed. Where do we see Compline? Well, like at, at St. Vladimir's during the Lenten and Advent season and the Nativity season, they do Compline every night. So all the seminarians have to come back to church at 9 o'clock and for a short service. We see Compline, uh, let me see, uh, when we do the... Um, can, can, uh, excuse me. The canon of St. Andrew is a compliment service. A canon is just a long reflection. We'll do it on uh, certain feast days like Christmas, Theophany, Annunciation, and Pascha, where we do this vigil. But it's actually just a compliment and a matins together. Just go with it. Um, so Compline is the service before you go to bed. So if you, go, when we do the, the, Saint, the, the canon of St. Andrew, you'll see one of the last prayers I do is I ask forgiveness of everyone and then I go to a blessing for everyone to kind of go home, go to bed. How long do you think they get to sleep? <clears throat> a couple hours. Because then you have the service called Nocturne. Nocturne is the service of midnight. You wake them up, you get them into the room, to the chapel, and you pray. You will see nocturne so quickly on one night a year, you don't even realize we just went through it. And that's on Easter night. Right? Right before I start, we start the canon and all the singing, of the, uh, uh, and I bring the shroud in. There's a very short service that I do, and I kind of stand out in the front. That's nocturne. It's probably the only time you'll see it in parish life. Unless you want me to get you all out of your bed and come in here and do services. So. so if you have, then you send them back to bed. So then you have the next service, which is matins or orthros. And matins is the service. We had the service of the setting of the sun. Now we have to have the service of the rising of the sun. And so matins is done um, for the service of the rising of the sun. So like in the Greek church on Sundays, on, in their tradition, this is one of the differences. They will do an orthros, a matins, then the liturgy. We just do the hours, which I'll explain in a second. In the, in the other typicon, we would do the matins along with the vespers, and it would be called the vigil, all night vigil. It used to go all through the night. Now it doesn't. Well, some places so every now and then I'll do a vigil service here for a feast day when I know I have the, the voices and the stuff. And I'll do it's basically a Vespers and a Mass together. But on a daily, there's, it's, it's slightly different. So what is the big thing about the Matins? Well, there's the gospel reading for the day. So that's where it's usually found in the, in the daily gospel reading. You also have what's called the polyleos. Polyleos means many lights. So we had that lamp that we lit for the evening. 
Now we're going to light all the lamps and this is a great day. And in some monasteries, they'll actually spin the chandelier and the lights will actually dance. Um, you know, or, or they'll, they'll take the lampadas that are hanging and they'll start making go back and forth. It's this idea of um, the dancing lights, the morning glory. And then we have what's called a cannon. A cannon is not something you shoot something out of, but it's a long, reflective scroll. So there's gazillion cannons. There's the, there's the normal cannons that we'll do for each uh, of the tones of the week, but there's cannons for saints, and there's cannons for all different types of things. When I do on Thursday, when I do the Akathis, I'll read a canon um, that was written by a priest who was in the Gulag about glory to God for all things, and that's what it is. Or when we did the outdoor service, I read a canon, you know, we were to the North American saints or to this saint or whatever. And it's usually in nine odes, nine different sections, each based on a biblical passage and then a reflection on that. It's very intense, you know, that they put all this stuff together. And if, if you do things the way they're really, really, really supposed to be done, you have like all these different canons interacting with each other, which can take hours, which I will not do. Because I don't have the energy. Then, after the matins, we have what's called the hours. The hours are basically a military watch. First hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour. Which roughly corresponds to 9 a.m., noon, wait, 6, 6 a.m., what is it? Yeah, 6 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m. And it, each one, because remember the, the reading on Holy Friday about Christ being betrayed. So you have the judgment, the cross, the crucifixion, and the death of Christ. That's the basics behind those. When will you see here the um, hours? When you walk in the church and someone's reading, they're doing the third hour. Most churches do third and sixth hour. But, um, uh, and then I'll do what's called the royal hours. That's when you, that was because the emperor would come and we take all th four of those hours and shove them into one service. So we'll do that on Christmas Eve. We'll do that on Theophany Eve. We do that on Annunciation Eve and we do that on Holy Friday. That's why they're called royal hours. They're taking those services and they're putting them into one service. <clears throat> right? And when you get done with the third hour, you're back to Vespers. Now, where does liturgy fit in? Well, I just kind of told you. If, you. if it is a day designated for liturgy, which can be every day, by the way, except for one day. There's only one day of the year you're not allowed to serve a divine liturgy. Holy Friday. It's the only day you're not allowed. It's the only fully, complete fast day. So much fast that you can't even receive communion. But that would be fit, that would fit in after the third hour, right? You come to church at nine o'clock, all right? So, you, questions? Pretty complex, isn't it? When it's done well, and you're in a monastery, you're in that routine. It becomes just part of your life. And I haven't spent that much time in a monastery that I have to. I spent enough. Let's put it that way. So the weekly cycle, right, we talked about. So that's the first wheel, the daily cycle. And somehow that's got to fit in to other stuff. So we have the weekly cycle, the octoyakos. We talked about that. It starts each Sunday evening, and it is that tone for the entire week. So every day of the, of the week has a specific, I think we have an octoyakos upstairs. I'm not sure. Um, and these are the themes. Sundays for the resurrection, Monday the angels, Tuesday John the Baptist, Wednesday the cross, uh, Thursday is the apostle and St. Nicholas, Friday the cross, Theotokos, and Saturday the saints and the departed. So for example, when I come out at the end of the service on Sunday, I say, he who rose from the dead, Christ our true God. Because that's the Sunday dismissal.
But like uh, uh, yesterday, I, I serve daily Vesper. I serve the Vespers at the seminary. <coughs> I say, because it's Wednesday evening, which is Thursday, I say, may Christ our true God through the prayers of St. Nicholas. Right? So listen carefully. You'll see, if, if you know, during the weekday services, that there will be a different type of dismissal. That's just a way that you can immediately recognize where those themes are coming from. If you look into the services themselves, there's other <coughs> stuff that's going on. Um, and, the, and the other thing to listen to is, on, is, particularly on Sunday, so we have what's called a troparian, a kantakian. A tropar is like your theme song. It's like the, you know, you have tropars for St. Nicholas. Right? That's the theme song. And Kentucky is kind of a secondary theme song. Or you have a tropar, O oh Lord, save thy people and bless thy inheritance. That's our tropar for the cross and the kind of the Orthodox national anthem. All right? Um, we sing St. Gregory's, right? Every Sunday we sing because our church is named after St. Gregory. So we sing that. So we have all these tropars, but we also have different ones for each Sunday each of the Octoikos. So on tone seven, we will sing the tropar, which on the resurrection, that's designated for tone seven. Okay? So that's why you'll hear every now and then, oh, I know that, so I recognize that hymn. Well, yeah, we probably sang it seven weeks ago. And after a time, it just becomes normal and you hear that. George, you pretty much know all of them too. Mm -hmm. I hear you singing along, because you just heard it all. So many times. Oh, we must be in this one. Yeah. And, oh, it's nice to hear this one again, you know, sort of thing. So that's what the tropar and the Kentuckians are. Of course, because you have all these cycles within cycles, some Sundays it seems like they go on forever, and some Sundays we're like, boom, boom, just a couple. It all depends on where we are in the, in the calendar. That's what the book tells us. Um, and then, like, the Prochemenon. The Prochemenon is in the fourth tone. Well, that's because that's the tone of the week we're in. And if we have two readings, we'll have two ones. And then feast days always seem to be tone four for some reason. But just, just go with it. Just go with it. And, yeah. So that's the, the, the ways in which we can clue in that there's something going on. Every, every eight weeks, we're going through a cycle. With me? All right. Yeah. You. Then we have the month, right? We talked about this. Each day is listed and has the saints and the themes of the day. And it is regional, right? So, for example, the Menaean of the Orthodox Church in America will probably be slightly different than the Menaean of the Greek Archdiocese. Why is that? Well, we have certain saints that we will emphasize. For example, American saints. And our Menaean is basically based on the Russian Menaean, because that's where our roots are, but we also incorporate the Romanians and the Bulgarians because we have all those different groups. Whereas the Greek one will be pretty much all the Greek saints. So you rarely will hear like the American saints, even though they're here in America, but we won't get me going on that. No surprises, I know. But they're, they are recognized. It just depends. However, there are certain saints that everyone knows. Like St. Nicholas, everyone sings about St. Nicholas, or St. George, or whatever. So there are universal ones <coughs> that are, everyone knows, but then there are sometimes ones that are really regional. And so there'll be a little different list of saints. Who comes up with that? That's what the bishops do. So they'll go and they'll say, These are, this is what our list of saints. So that's why, if I look on, if you, I'll show you this. If you look for Sunday, look at all the saints that are listed there. Those are all the saints for that day, right? See that? See? See? There's a whole bunch. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So how do I know which one I choose? The one in, right. in bold space. Oh. That's the main one. <laughs> Some priests will do the whole list. But I was always taught you do the one the ones that are in bold, that's the main saints that you're gonna remember. Of that of that region? Of of the uh, for us. Okay. For us. Some don't have any. You just take the top one. Or if you look and say, oh, I like this saint. Like, oh, this is St. Tikhon of the of his date of his death. I'm going to remember St. Tikhon. 
So, and some are very obscure. The martyr of Gobron and 133 soldiers of Georgia. You know, I mean, Georgia, that's probably big. We have Georgian parishes in the OCA. That's why we include them. So it's really, you kind of go with whatever the list may do. Sometimes you have none. Transfiguration. It's a major feast day. They're not going to have anybody other than that feast to be remembered on that day. And, um, and again, with these saints, some we know a lot about. We have whole lives written about them. We have whole hymns written about them. And some we know very little. It's been lost in the, in the, in the, the mist of time. And so you'll kind of hear there's a standard tropar for different types of saints. You know, it's just like, yeah, he's a martyr, so he must be this. <laughs> he must have done this, so we'll sing about this, even though we really don't know anything about him. Um, the general rule is the shorter the troparian is, the older it is. We had only just short ones, just, but as the church developed, they got longer and longer, and some of them could be pretty long, the hymns. So that's more new in our sense of new, which could be like a thousand years. That's new for us, as opposed to short. Yeah? For new saints, so when you're going to put them in that book, yeah. That would be the day that they're, they're made a saint or the day It depends died. what the, the synod decides. You could do it on their birthday. You could do it on the day that they died, which is usually what happens. Or you, could, you when you don't know necessarily when they died, you may do it on the day that the, the, that the church declares them a saint. And some will have multiple days. If you're really important, you can have a couple of different feast days for your names. So they're not officially a saint until their canonization? Yes. Specific day? Like St. Olga now? Well, or like, for example, example I'm going to talk about this on Sunday. St. Olga is a new saint for North America. In the proclamation, if you read it, they already assigned. This is the date that her, she will be commemorated on. They now instructed a certain a, a committee to write the hymn, to write, put the service together, write the tropar, and to get the official icon painted, that will be the model for other icons. But there's a bunch out there already, on both cases, actually. So they're probably just going to collect it. We all knew this was going to happen one day. We just didn't know when. So, so it's kind of exciting. You're going to see over this year, as her everything gets kind of fleshed out and then put out to the church. Yeah? Will her canonization or whatever, glorification, whatever you want to call it, Yes, it will. Um, the problem is that where she is buried is up on the Cusquam River, mm -hmm. and it's a tiny village, so there's like no place for anybody to stay. Mm -hmm. So they have to exhume her, which they will do, and then they'll uh, revest her, and then they'll place her relics, in a, and they'll get relics from her, and then they'll place her body. Either they'll put it back, or they will place it somewhere where other people can go in pilgrimage mm -hmm. to venerate it. Um, I was there when they exhumed St. Tico, uh, St. Uh, Alexis Todd, when they, they took him out of the grave and then they opened the casket and he was almost all preserved, like, except for his toe. Cause there was a leak in the casket and the water was dripping <laughs> on his toe, but they, he, and they revested him and all that and put him, now he's in the, the church at St. Tico's, the main monastery church. They have a section set aside for him. So, um, so I'm going to be curious what they're going to do. They may have to move her body from there to like the cathedral in Anchorage, then do the service, and then figure out whether she'll stay there or go back to the village. But St. Saint Saint Herman, he didn't want his body moved. And he was buried on, on Spruce Island. And they were, it's very hard to get to Spruce Island, and you can end up getting stranded there. So the Synod at that time decided they were going to bring his body to the cathedral in Kodiak and do the service there. And every time they went to send the boat out, there was a horrible storm and they couldn't get the body out. Which should have been a hint, right? That maybe he didn't want to be moved. But then they got a helicopter and they took him by helicopter. So if you look at one of his icons, you actually have an Orthodox Byzantine helicopter in the icon. And they brought it by helicopter to the cathedral and that's where he has remained, at the cathedral. 
and the place where he was buried is underneath where the little church is, and you can actually go underneath there. I, in my office, I have a big box of dirt from his site where he was buried. And he was the last one before now. Oh. He was our first American saint. We've had 13 or 14 since then. Since then. Yeah. The last one, well, we have his icon. There's a couple of newer ones that were not by the OCA, but by other jurisdictions who served here in America. Um, I, gave, I, gave, I gave a talk about one of them um, one Saturday. Uh, Seraphim of Uglik, who was up in Alaska. He's probably the last one. There was... Uh, yeah, there's been, there's been a couple of them. Sebastian Dubovich, John Popovich, yeah, what? Raphael. Raphael was a joint between the Antiochian Church and the uh, OCA. He's out there. The Antiochian Church. Yeah, he's out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, yep. Saint Innocent, Saint Tikhon are in Moscow. I got to venerate them. They opened the casket. Oh, wow. And because um, that's where they died. Some we don't know. Saint Alexander Hodovitsky uh, disappeared in the gulag. We have no idea. St. Juvenali, we know generally where he's buried in Alaska. We know he's in this area, and a, a church has kind of been built over, but they lost the records in a fire. So they've been doing ground surveillance radars, and they think they've located where the casket is. But they're very, obviously, they want to be too, totally sure before they dig it up, and it's not him. So, um, but St. Juvenali may be exhumed at some point. It seems weird for people who are not orthodox, but for us it's like totally normal. So, moving on. What time is it? Okay, so yeah, we're moving along. So I already told you the book. So we have the Lenten Triodion, which is from pre-Lent. Remember this simple rule. We always talk about what we're going to do. We do it. We talk about what we just did, and then we say goodbye. All right, so we have a pre-feast, we have the feast, we have the after-feast, and we have the leave-taking, taking leave, saying goodbye. All right, so if you see those terms show up. So Easter is the ultimate one. We have a pre-Lenten, a preparation, then we have the Lenten period, then we have Holy Week, then we have Easter, then we have the post-Paschal period, all the way up through Pentecost, which means 40, 40 days, or 50, 50 days after, and then we have all saints and all saints of a country, then we say goodbye. <laughs> so that's like the ultimate long thing. But every feast has that same sort of cycle. So for pre-Lent, and all those are named, so in pre-Lent, when you see Zacchaeus Sunday, which is, you know that we're starting to come up to Lent, because remember, we have those things to, to make the calendar up until pre-Lent. Then, then it's fixed on what are this, each Sunday's theme. So again, short year, long year. But once we get to Zacchaeus, we're back on cycle. So we have Zacchaeus Sunday, publican and the Pharisee, prodigal son, the last judgment, which is meat fair, which means farewell to meat. And then we have um, expulsion from paradise, we call it forgiveness Sunday, which is also cheese fair when you're supposed to stop eating the dairy. And then you go into the fast. So those are all the preparation Sundays. Then we get into the Lent, right? And we have a, each Sunday has a different theme through Lent. You have Sunday of Orthodoxy, then Gregory Palamas, Sunday of the Cross, which is the halfway, John Climacus and Mary of Egypt. Right? Each of those Sundays are fixed. You're always going to have that same theme. And then, um, and then that leads us into the Holy Week, which I think I have a slide. Yeah, I have a slide just for that. And then there was a couple of things that happened during Lent. We have what's called pre-sanctified liturgy. Right? That's on Wednesdays and Fridays. And other certain days is determined. And what that is is an extra chance for us to receive communion. And it's just like it means, pre-sanctified. In other words, I, instead of one lamb on Sunday, I make three lambs, and two of them are placed aside. And they, they would be used at the service. And it's basically a Vesper service with a liturgy, kind of liturgy shoved together. I think it's one of the most beautiful of the services that we do during Lent. It's very peaceful, very beautiful. We also have other services, such as 
That first week, we do the Canon of St. Andrew, right? Which is a Compline service, but it's a reflective service every day for the first four days. About And we do a lot of prostrations and a lot of things. Uh, and it helps us kind of focus in on Lent. We also do things such as um, different akathas, like the Theotokos at a certain point. We do a service just for Mary. And um, you'll notice in the, not on Sundays, because Sundays are a resurrection day, but all the other services during the week will do the St. Ephraim's prayer, which is when we do the bowing down and the prostrations and all that sort of stuff. So again, um, you know, there's one other thing. Oh, we'll have like Memorial Saturdays, which are designated to remember the departed. Or we may have, uh, or, and we also, in addition, have um, other services that will be designated throughout Lent that we, you just do as part of that cycle. All right? So, there you go. Holy Week is just our week of getting down and get funky and trying to get through the week, right? And it begins on Lazarus Saturday. The first way in which you start talking about the resurrection. Then we have Palm Sunday, which is a kind of a lifting up. Awesome. Right? So think if Lent is 40 days, we are actually not in Lent during Holy Week. We're actually out of Lent. We're in a special week. And then we have Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday, Holy Wednesday, where we have these things called bridegroom matins. Right? That's we, but we serve them in the evening. But didn't you just say matins is a morning service? We do this weird thing where we kind of move everything up. You kind of count backwards and you kind of move things around. If You don't do that in monasteries, but in parish life, you're anticipating the next day. So we're doing matins, but even though it's at night. Just go with it. What, what? It's Holy Week. Yeah, it's Holy Week. So just go with it. Um, and they have, they're beautiful, they're cool called the end because it's the last of the instructions that we have in the church and then some churches like the Greek tradition is to have holy unction on Wednesday which I don't do and I don't like to do because then you move you ruin, you lose the whole idea of what Holy Thursday is which is the day of the commemoration of the first Eucharist so and it's not the last supper that's not the point it's the first Eucharist initiation of the Eucharist. And in some places they call that Red Thursday. That they'll actually go out of black or purple and wear red as a brighter color. Um, I don't. <laughs> then Holy Thursday, Thursday, Holy Friday is that strict fast day. We have a whole bunch of church, right? On, on Thursday evening we have that reading with all the 12 gospel readings. And we go to reenact the crucifixion. Holy Friday we have the royal hours. We have um, <clears throat> the Vespers, we bring the shroud out. The evening, when we bring the shroud around the church. And in many traditions, um, when you bring the shroud out on the evening, ser on the Vesper service in the afternoon, someone should be in the church at all times until we start the Easter service. And so we're going to try doing that this year. You said your last year. People, you said I'm going to put a sign up back. sheet and people can sign up to go and, and, and stand vigil over the grave. And what you do is you read from the Psalms and you take one hour. And I have great memories as a kid, my father and my brothers and I going and spending our hour before the tomb. So we're hopefully we'll be able to do that this year. And, um, <clears throat> and then we go for, from the Holy Sat into Holy Saturday, which is the great Vesper liturgy with the 15 Old Testament readings and the, and we change from black to white because we're in the resurrection. So you were right. See, we have the Vespers, we're into the next day. But we're not fully in it. We're there, but we're not quite there. Right? And so, um, and then we go from that and then we go to the Pascha service, which we begin with the Compline, the Nocturne, the matins when we start going around the church and saying, and I sense every canon I sense around the church and I'm exhausted. And we have the liturgy and then we have the Vespers that morning, which is the greatest. It's the only time in the week, in the year that you are going to have breakfast before church because it's just a Vesper service. So you, you already had the, the communion 
And it's so wonderful to get your capacity and everything you need. You go to church like civilized people. And, and that's called the Apostle Vespers. Which, if you do it correctly, and the priest is not totally wiped out and exhausted, you're supposed to do Apostle Liturgy and Apostle Vespers every day that week. I do it on Monday, where we go to the four sides of the church and read the four gospel readings. And then I'll do it on Saturday when we close the doors. Because the doors will be open that whole week. Otherwise, I need rest. I'm not young anymore. Right. Bright week. We already talked about that. You, the artos is a beautiful bread that we put out in the center of the church. Uh, to symbolize the resurrection. It stays in the center of the church all the way to Saturday. And then we cut it up and we all eat it. So you'll notice that during the 40 days after Easter that I will start the services different. We'll be singing Christ is Risen. I start, I, there's a way in which you serve the services. It's much more joyful. Um, it kind of like, it takes you down from bright week and you go down a little bit and then you go down a little bit and then you're back into normal time. But the thing is that during the Paschal period, you're not supposed to go on your knees. You're supposed to be raised. So you'll see that we won't go on our knees, we won't do any of that stuff, until the first time that we go back on our knees is on Pentecost, 50 days, and I have the kneeling prayers. Remember, I go in front there and I do those kneeling prayers and my knees are killing me. That's supposed to be the first time that we are allowed to go back on our knees. And then Pentecost, Pentecost is when we switch everything from white to green. In Russia, they don't do white. They do red. Because they say red is a brighter color. They'll wear white for the matin service, and then they'll change over to red for the rest of the time. My father always used to do that. It's like, I don't have time to change vestments. And I just stay white. So just recently, you went on your knees for the first time. Recently. For the first time, I want to say... No. You haven't been on, I think we have, because of the hard floor. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm saying we all went uh, recently. Oh, we yeah, the, 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 the new floor. Yeah. yeah, but it's the first time we went on our knees. Oh, since during, during the Holy the, the Feast Pascha. of the Cross, we did that. Right, that was the first time since Pascha. Well, no, people go on to new knees. Well, you, yourself. No, I do. Oh. After I consecrate the gifts, I always do a prostration. No, I'm saying everyone. Re oh, people do that all the time. Yeah. It just you just remember the time when we formally do it, right? So, at, just like we had those Sundays before Easter that had themes, of course, after Easter we're going to have themes. So we have Thomas Sunday, which is the seventh day, right? Just read one week after the resurrection, or called Antipasca, not Antipasca, like you eat. Antipasca means. The, next, the second Pascha, the beyond Pascha. Radenitsa, which is the eighth day, because remember the eighth day, Thomas. So that's traditional for the priest to go to all the cemeteries and bless all the graves. Murmur Sunday, paralytic, Samaritan woman, blind man, ascension, which is 40 days. Then we, and, the, and at that point, by the way, when I bring that shroud in on Pascha night, it sits on the altar until ascension. So I serve on the shroud. I have a nice plexiglass to put on top. I had one in Montana that was all puffy. It was a Greek woman brought it from Greece. It was too puffy. And it was like my chalices where I had to get like something to remove the puffiness of it. And then 50 days, which is the kneeling prayers. And then we have all saints. So our Halloween is the Sunday after Pentecost. Because what is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? The saints. And then we have the following Sunday, which is All Saints of the Region. Right? So for here, it's All Saints of North America. We celebrate, and then we go to normal time. But one thing you notice, we're back into the cycle. So what did I say about November 19th? It's the 24th Sunday after Pentecost. So that means it's been 24 Sundays since the last Pentecost. And it keeps going all the way that until we get back, and then we start dating it again. Because we know if it's the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, this must be the reading because throughout the Orthodox world, they're all reading the same readings on the 24th Sunday 
after Pentecost, no matter where, who you are or where you are. All right? And finally, just a bit of things. So we have, so anything that's related to Christmas, uh, to uh, Easter, whether it's um, Ascension, Pentecost, Palm Sunday, those feasts are movable according to when Easter falls. So they, they're called movable feasts. But we have 12 feasts that we have, and here they are, which are fixed. And each of them usually has something associated with it. In a sense, we kind of create, we bless all of creation in one year. So, November, September 8th was the Nativity of the Theotokos. If you go 40 days after that, you come to Presentation, which is on Tuesday. That's because 40 days is when we traditionally baptize. That's in the Old Testament when the child was presented to Christ. Uh, Christ the child was presented to God. And um, we do that as well. And so we're at the 40 days. We have the elevation of the cross. That's out of time, but just know that that's when the true cross was found. Um, the Othony, when we bless the water, Christmas. Now, if you take December 25th and go nine months back, when do you come to? Annunciation, March 25th. The perfect pregnancy, right? Exactly nine months. And then he's born. If you take, I think it's with the Theotokos, from her conception to her birth, it's like nine months plus a day. And for John the Baptist, it's nine months minus a day, something like that. Only the perfect pregnancy is Christ. These are lesser feast days. Um, but we have all the other ones. Trans Some of them we do it because there's a reason for the do it on that date. Some of them like Transfiguration, that great feast day, which is my birthday. <laughs> the only reason it's August 6th is that's the date that the church was consecrated on, the, on Mount Tabor. So they all have, but they all have a date. They're always that same time. And remember I said September 1st is the Byzantine New Year. The last feast of the year before that is Dormition, the death of Mary. And the first feast is the birth of Mary. So her life kind of encompasses the life of the church, just as her body encompassed the Christ. It's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. So anyway, and everything has something, like on Theophany we'll bless water, and then I'll go to everybody's home and bless their homes if they invite me. Um, we'll bless candles. Uh, we'll have blessing the fruit, right, that we do on Transfigurations, or blessing flowers. Blessing, there's all different things. There's other ones where you bless honey, you bless this, you bless that. We're always blessing things. We just like to bless. And there are some important minor feasts, in the church that have, like, St. Nicholas is a big feast, right? We bring St. Nicholas, he'll come and visit and give gifts to the kids. Um, some of them, like St. Peter and Paul, will actually have a feast, a fasting period before that. Of course, depending on when Pentecost is, that could be a long fast, like 40 days, almost as long as Lent. Or, because Easter's Late this year, it's going to be very short. It, I think it's almost a negative fast. Like, there's no fast. You're just, like, right on top of it. So we're already in fast? Is that why? No, because it, it, it's... The calendar. It, the calendar. Okay. Um, we also have, uh, before Dormition, we'll have those two weeks in August, where we do the Dormition fast, before the Feast of Dormition. I've never had a good explanation, by the way, on the Apostles' Fast. Another, like St. Herman is big in America, right? So we're going to celebrate St. Herman. Um, that's coming up in December. So again, we have different days that have different things. And finally, I want to just talk a little bit about the fasting period. So we know the great ones. Lent. Then we have Advent. That's another 40 days. We started that already. Then we have the Apostles' Fast, which can be very, very long or very, very short. And then we have the Dormition Fast, which is always August 1st to August 15th. All right? And in the Orthodox way of thinking, and it's a very Jewish way of thinking, we fast to celebrate. 
In other words, we're giving something up for God because we're thankful to God. We don't fast to punish ourselves. We fast to celebrate. And we have to keep that in mind. Now, we also have, but the church is good to us. So there'll be certain periods where they'll call them fast-free weeks. Eat whatever you want. I don't care. Go, go to town. Right after Easter, right? It's a fast-free week. Um, right before we enter Great Lent, the church gives us a fast-free week. Like, go ahead, knock yourselves out because you know what's coming up, <laughs> right? Um, and there are other times um, after Pentecost and Nativity, from the Nativity, when we celebrate Nativity, to Theophany is also a fast-free period. So the church always gives us these opportunities to really celebrate. Um, we also, we'll talk about this at another, another time, but we have certain days will be dedicated called strict fast days. What does that mean? That means you really shouldn't eat between sunrise and sunset. There are only a couple of them. Christmas Eve, Theophany Eve, Holy Friday, beheading of John the Baptist, but you should eat as minimal as possible and should try to keep it as quiet as possible. It's a strict fast day for a reason. And Holy Friday, as I said, is the strictest of strict fast days where you can't even receive communion on that day. And we'll talk about it in another class about how to fast and all the things that we do and what meat fast and dairy fast and all that sort of stuff because here in the Lovely, lovely book. You'll see they'll have a little thing here. A fast day. Then they have a fast day. Fish, wine, and oil are allowed. Remember, these are months. They don't eat meat to begin with. So if they say they can eat wine, fish, and oil, that's like, woo-hoo! We have a good time. We get to eat fish today. Or sometimes they'll say, because oil is a luxury. Like, it's, and fish is a luxury. Usually they just eat dry Food, basically. Wine is a definite luxury, right? So, but we'll talk about that in another class. So I covered a lot here. All I want you to understand is that there is this beautiful gift that the church has given, handed down of all this beautiful liturgical richness. And remember, we have days, which goes into weeks, which goes into year, months, which goes into years. All those cycles are all at play. So when we go up and you come next Sunday and you're hearing all those hymns and all the things, the movable parts of the service, think of all that's gone into that to determine that that's what we hear and that the whole church is hearing that same thing because God has given us that opportunity through all these cycles. And then if you hear different things like akathis, that just means a prayer service. So there's many, many, many akathis. Or if you hear something like Vesperal Liturgy, certain feast days you have the Vespers and a Liturgy that are put together. Because there's a, a cycle that you have to do that the church determines you do. Basically it's Christmas, Theophany, Annunciation, and Pascha. There's a cycle that you have to go through. Of this type of liturgy, and that type of liturgy, and this, and that goes with this. To make sure we get the fullness of the expression of that feast. That's how important the church thinks. Other questions? Any questions? Just know that there's just a beauty to all of this. All right, so no class next week. When we come back the following week, we're going to start on the Divine Liturgy. We'll start talking about the Divine Liturgy. That's a two-part class, and we're going to start first with the preparation and what it means, what happens before you guys even show up to church. And then we'll talk about the, the Liturgy. All right? Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. It is truly me to bless you, Theotokos, ever blessed and the most pure in the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without corruption, you gave birth to God the Word. True, Theotokos, we magnify you. Through the prayers of the Holy Fathers of Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.